Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last year, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. And Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we're about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, in what we hope, what we believe are the closing months of this pandemic, we know that transformation is necessary, that we cannot go back to the world as it was. Arundhati Roy wrote at the start of this pandemic that historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging all that we have, or we can walk through lightly, with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and to fight for it. What other world will we imagine? How will we bring it into being? Step lightly and with little luggage, beloveds, there is still much work to be done. Our chalice lighting words this morning are from the Reverend Gretchen Haley, who writes, It starts here, in this moment, in this breath you feel rising in your chest, this beat building between us, the healing, the hunger, the hope, the courage, the calling, the commitment. The drawing out of a new day, it begins now, in the imagination. In this story we weave together, this song we sing this prayer, we bring into being from our hearts to our lips, from our hands to our life, our shared life. It starts here with praise and thanksgiving, forgiveness, and this humble centering confession that we could be wrong, this promise that we make to keep learning, to keep trying, to keep our sense of humor, to keep close this knowing that we are all in this together. Come, let us begin. Come, let us worship together. What will I build? What will I build? And 
what will I find? My story begins. Story begins inside my mind. Inside my mind. In my imagination. My imagination. What is an imagination? Lucy, do you know what imagination means? Mm -mm. I think imagination is what helps people create new things all the time. Because you can't create new things if you can't imagine what you want them to be. That is absolutely true, Jacob. Everything human made was an idea first. You know, one of my favorite imaginers in history was Leonardo da Vinci. I loved that he imagined that human beings could fly hundreds of years before we figured out how to do it. And Dr. King is another great imaginer. His speeches about the dream that he had outlined a vision for how people could live better together in this country. It was all about having that vision first and then finding the words to communicate it. And then being inspired to certain actions that would bring it closer and closer to reality. Do you like to make up stories? Uh, when you play with your magnets mm -hmm. or when you play with your babies? Mm -hmm. That's using your imagination, thinking of stories and characters who are doing things all inside your mind. It's amazing. We have movies playing in our minds all the time. And it's really important to be the director of our movies to recognize that we can tell ourselves stories that make us feel good or stories that make us feel bad. And we get to choose which thoughts we have. We just have to practice deciding how we use our imaginations. Can you think of something that maybe doesn't exist yet or that no one has ever seen, but that can make your life better or make the world better for those of us who are sharing it, I would love to know what kind of ideas you have about how the future could be and that you're already starting to imagine and that one day all of us will see. Who will I be? Who will I be? And what will I see? And what will I see? In this great world. In this great world. Who could be free? Who could be free? What will I build? What will I build? And what will I find? What will I find? My story begins. My story begins. Inside my mind. Inside my mind. In my imagination. Ooh, my imagination. Only it is so very lonely here, Alice said in a melancholy voice. And at the thought of her loneliness, two large tears came rolling down her cheeks. Oh, don't go on like that, cried the poor queen, wringing her hands in despair. Consider what a great girl you are. Consider what a long way you've come today. Consider what o'clock it is. Consider anything, only don't cry. Alice could not help laughing at this, even in the midst of her tears. <laughs> Can you keep from crying by considering things? She asked. That is the way it's done, the queen said with great decision. Nobody can do two things at once, you know. Let's consider your age to begin with. How old are you? I am seven and a half, exactly. You needn't say exactly, the queen remarked. I can believe it without that. Now I'll give you something to believe. I am just 101, five months and a day. I can't believe that, said Alice. Can't you, said the queen in a pitying tone. Try again, draw a long breath and shut your eyes. Alice laughed. <laughs> There's no use trying, she said. One cannot believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the queen. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I've believed in as many as six impossible things before breakfast. 
Each Sunday when we're together in person, we pass the offering plates and take up a collection to support the work of the church. While we're online, we ask that you consider sending a check in the mail, giving through Realm, or sending an offering via text giving. Simply text UC Lincoln space and the amount to 73256. These instructions are also in the chat box. And thank you for your support of our work. impossible things before breakfast. It is a new year, beloveds. Five years ago, the comedian John Oliver ended his season by blowing up a sculpture of 2015, because surely there would never be a year with so much nonsense in it. And towards the end of 2020, I got a package without a note to say who it was from, and inside was an ornament for our Christmas tree. A dumpster, complete with light-up flames. So, can we just pause it as we begin that 2020 was uh, hot trash as years go? Even those of us who had pretty good years, personally, and I'm one of those. These years existed in the context of a global pandemic that profoundly changed every aspect of our communities. And there were disappointments that were legion. Maybe it was missing friends and family in person. Maybe it was a year without local baseball. Maybe it was the rapid change in expectations at work. Maybe it was the church meeting online instead of in person. We all had disappointments. It's just not a year of our collective best. This does not need to have been the only story, and it does not need to be the only story going forward, especially at this new year. We tend to consider imagination too lightly, Thomas More wrote in The Reenchantment of Everyday Life, forgetting that the life we make for ourselves individually and for the world as a whole is shaped and limited only by the perimeters of our imagination. Moore goes on to say, things are as we imagine them to be, 
as we imagine them into existence. Now, I don't believe, and I'm not going to preach, that the world is as simple as if you can imagine a thing to be true, it will manifest. That's a well-worn canard of self-help seminars and prosperity gospel preaching, and I find it neither congruent with our tradition or my experience of the world. But I can imagine my daughter growing up kind, brave, capable, unencumbered by childhood trauma. I can visualize that. But simply me visualizing it is not enough to make it happen. It requires a lot of work to make that imagining come true. But while imagination is not sufficient to ensure that Ailish's life is all those things, it is necessary. Anything hard or especially worth doing asks us to have a vision of what we are working towards, of what could be. And so in order to build a better world, we need to be able to imagine it even if that feels like believing six impossible things before breakfast. The London School of Life puts it this way on their website. It may sound strange to locate the problem here, but some of our most despairing moods are caused by failures of the imagination. What we mean by imagination is the power to summon alternatives. When we are sad, we can't imagine finding another job, a different partner, relocating to a different city. It is therefore key to assert a theoretical truth from the outset. With sufficient imagination, almost any problem can be worked around. If one door has closed, the imagination should in time be able to find another. If 200 doors are closed, then there will be a 201st door to locate. If plan A has fallen, we can land on plan B, or C, or Z. Imagination is the frame that holds the universe of the possible. And the year that just ended was defined by limits, limits on what was possible, on what we could do, where we could go, how we could gather. But it was also a year where the universe of the possible expanded in new and unexpected directions. A year ago in worship planning, a year ago right now, we were wondering if the congregation could function without a, <laughs> without a printed order of service handed to everybody as they walked into the sanctuary. Now, well, here we are. So my question, indeed my challenge to you as we put 2020 to rest and embark on 2021 is this. How can we imagine this coming year to broaden the universe of the possible? The following poem is by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. It's called Sorrow's Uses. The uses of sorrow I comprehend better and better at each year's end. Deeper and deeper I seem to see why and wherefore it has to be. Only after the dark, wet days do we fully rejoice in the sun's bright rays. Sweeter the crust tastes after the fast than the sated gourmand's finest repast. The faintest cheer sounds never amiss to the actor who was once heard a hiss. To one who the sadness of freedom knows, light seem the fetters love may impose. And he who has dwelt with his heart alone hears all the music in friendship's tone. So better and better I comprehend how sorrow ever would be our friend. In this congregation we contain multitudes, those of us experience joy, sorrow, both, and everything in between. As the next song plays, please type the name of yourself or someone that you're holding in your heart, either in joy or in sorrow or in any other way that you see fit.
The following reading is from Arundhati Roy from The Pandemic is a Portal. Whatever it is, coronavirus has made the mighty kneel and brought the world to a halt like nothing else could. Our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to, quote, normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. But the rupture exists, and in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage ready to imagine another world, and ready to fight for it. What would it feel like to walk, as Arundhati Roy describes, into this new year lightly, with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and fight for it? A year ago, I preached about beginnings on the the first Sunday that I was preaching, I talked about the long road to launching a second worship service and how I believed that the 2020s would be defined by three interlocking interrelated challenges, that of systemic racism, civic instability, and climate change. Now, that's going to be a really easy sermon to date someday. In retrospect, um, when I preached it, I had a member, or I had a family member in the hospital with a serious unexplained pneumonia with cardiac involvement that responded well to steroids. The week before, after spending Christmas with that uh, same family member, I was so sick that I missed the launch of our second service, a thing that we'd been working on for a full year, and and, uh, that meant I had to be really, really sick. I did not. We did not know that a global pandemic would join those three interlocking crises of the 2020s, even though there were certainly signs at that point. But Arundhati Roy's point has stayed with me since. Because, perversely, perhaps, the pandemic has left me more hopeful than I was a year ago find myself able to imagine in new ways, and the universe of the possible opens up just a little bit. G.K. Chesterton said that fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be defeated, that they can be beaten. Dragons are disasters. There's no way around that but to go through. 
and the cost the cost of a pandemic is enormous so many lives lost so many lives changed we will be reckoning with the aftermath of 2020 for a very long time but while it has come at tremendous cost case rates are starting to decline even as a vaccination campaign begins this pandemic is going to end and how will it end by scientists and local policymakers through a combination of new technologies and relentless messaging to change behavior and it's going to do that despite politicians and many people declaring loudly and without evidence that it's all a hoax and even if it isn't it's China's fault Now, I feel like the connection from that to why I'm starting 2020 more optimistic about, say, climate change is implicit and clear. But for the sake of direct communication, let us make the implicit explicit. Early on, I heard someone compare the pandemic to climate change with a fast forward button. The challenges are similar from a policy lens. They require cooperation, huge technical investments in infrastructure, and mass behavior change. And the reason that I find myself hopeful, that I find my imagination of the possible just a little wider, is that on the first day we make it 24 hours without a COVID-19 case reported, we are going to know that dragons can be beaten. Climate change and systemic inequality both require enormous behavior change on a level I could not have imagined a year ago. Now, though, we've certainly learned we can get by with flying less. And while it's been rocky, most of the world has changed its patterns of consumption. And Cheap, clean energy and carbon sequestration are difficult technologies to develop, but so is an mRNA-based vaccine. Last, by imagining a wider universe of possibilities, we compel ourselves to action. You can either think that the world is getting better, or that the future will be much better than it is now, Angela Oguntala writes, or you can think it is getting worse. But that continuum isn't as important to me, actually, as this idea of do you have agency in this world that is either getting better or worse. When it comes to our futures, we have hope, we have fear, but sometimes we forget that we also have influence. And that means we can choose the future we want to work towards. Nothing is written in stone. So if imagination is the frame of what is possible, where does our imagination lead us now, at the start of a new year? What is the world we want to imagine together? What do we want our universe of possibilities to look like? because dragons can be defeated. And so what do we want to work towards? Amen. Oh, no, 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 no,
Our closing words this morning come from Peter Jackson's interpretation of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Two Towers. It's all wrong, Samwise says. By rights, we shouldn't even be here, but we are. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were, and sometimes you didn't want to know the end, because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass, a new day will come. And when the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you, that meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't because they were holding on to something. That there was some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. Blessed be, and amen.